This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Hey everybody, it's John Hall, the senior editor at Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, and sitting across from me at a conference room in Midtown Manhattan is Leslie Henderson of Lazy Magnolia in Mississippi. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. We're going to talk about brewing in the South, fighting post-prohibition laws, brewing with fun ingredients, and maybe even something that falls from the heavens uh, in just a few minutes. But first, I want to say that as the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling, Gene D. Chillers has set the standard on quality service and dedication to their customers' craft. For 25 years, G&D has led the way on innovative solutions that match their brewing customers' immediate and future needs. With a wide selection of custom-built chillers, G&D offers the Nano Chiller, the perfect solution for nano breweries all the way up to their larger capacity units like the Vertical Air Chiller, built for higher volume operations. Contact G&D Chillers today for your chiller sizing needs at 1-800-555-0973 or reach out online at gdchillers.com. This episode is also brought to you by the Craft Brewers Conference and Brew Expo America, America's largest craft brewing industry gathering. Gather your peers in Denver April 8th through 11th, and details are at craftbrewersconference.com. I imagine you'll be there, Leslie, as a board member of the BA? You bet. Okay. Before you were a board member at the BA and long before... uh, you were sitting here at a conference room where we're here in Manhattan. The Brewers Association is doing a media dinner tonight, and they brought you into town to uh, talk to the ink-stained wretches like myself on all that's good uh, in beer. You were an accidental home brewer. I was sort of an accidental home brewer. You're right. Um, it started out as a Christmas present for my husband. And not for, was, not even for you. No, it wasn't for me. That's the funny part. Um, engineers are impossible to shop for. <laughs> Um, because they will either make what they want or they will just go out and buy it ahead of time. So, um, I got this idea from some friends we were taking flying lessons with and thought, wow, what a fun, interesting project. I had to order this stuff from Minnesota. Wait, hang on a second. So flying lessons and drinking don't normally go together. No, the flying lessons were early in the day Uh and the drinking was later in the day. You always celebrate not dying yeah. after a flying lesson. Okay. Yeah. All right. So anyway. So the beer kits um, had to be purchased from way out of state because home brewing was illegal in Mississippi at the time. I didn't know this. So you couldn't even go to a Bed Bath & Beyond and get no. a Mr. Beer Kit? Absolutely not. Fast you could smart. order one in. There was, there was nobody checking packages coming into the state. There was just no, no home brewing in the state, so why would somebody have a home brew shop? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. um, got the kit. And um, as it turns out, I'm the chemical engineer. So anything involving you know, microbiology and fun processes like that, that was my strong suit. And Mark's electrical engineer. So after the first batch, I got him onto building gadgets like a counterflow work chiller, mm-hmm. a special box for aging the beers at the right temperature. So he became my gadget guy, and I was more focused on the recipes. He would come up with crazy ideas like, let's put pecans in a beer. And I would go, that's a terrible idea, but I know enough chemistry, I can figure this out. So that became you know, how we split up the duties. So yes, it was a very accidental project, um, accidental hobby. Um, Mark and I, we do love beer, but in not huge quantities. So in order to do the experimentation we needed to do, we ended up with a lot of beer. So we needed a lot of friends to drink it. And that's where our first fan base came from. So... What were some of the experiments? Like where, like where did it take you at the um, time? Because a lot of brewers get into it and they say, okay, I'm going to progress from a blonde ale to a pale ale to an IPA and maybe I'll start screwing around with, you know, or I'm going to go all grain from extract or... But you took it in, in wildly different directions. Um, well, at the homebrew level... Um at the time, I, compared to today's brewers, yeah. I wouldn't say we're, we were all that adventuresome. Of course, we didn't, we didn't really know what was available. Um, so 
we quickly went to all grain. It just seemed like I had more control over everything happening there. We would do parameter studies. That's what engineers and scientists do. The same wort, divide it up, and then try a different yeast, try a different temperature profile for fermentation. So we were really on the nerdy side of things going, what really happens if you change that mash temperature? Does it really make that much of a difference? And for me, I always found it very exciting to go, wow, this higher mash temperature did make a maltier beer. That's amazing. I do have that control. And that's what got me really excited. Um, so that and we, we dabbled a little bit in mead. That was fun too. Okay. And you were doing this because, I mean, one, you enjoyed the process of it, but where you're living at the time was not necessarily welcoming to the types of beers that you were making or mead, certainly, uh, the beers that, you know, the, the drinks that you wanted to, to make and drink and share with your friends. Sure. I mean, it started as a hobby and that, but the hobby is where I developed my appreciation for beer. Knowing how it was made gave me an appreciation for good beers that I could try when I was traveling. And I wouldn't have had that appreciation if I didn't understand how it was made. And that's why home brewers really are the brewery's best friend. Um, we cherish them. They understand what we go through to make a beer um, more than anybody else possibly could. But you're right, at the time, Mississippi had a limit on the alcohol content of beer. So that alone limited what was available in the state. So you were part of the push to make sure that the laws got changed, that, they, that people were aware. Um, but at what point, at what point did you say to yourselves, okay, we're doing this. Let's really jump into the deep end and go commercial with it. Um, as far as starting a commercial brewery, that was pretty early into our home brewing career because we saw a huge gaping hole in the South. Yeah. The craft beer revolution had happened in so many places already, and there was a little bit happening in the South, but it just wasn't catching fire really fast. So we saw an opportunity to bring it to Mississippi. Um, you got to bring it because yeah. it's not going to come on its own. Um, we, it, For us, it was always more than just a brewery. It was more than just about building a business. We could have done that anywhere. It was more about this This is a way that we could really make an impact on Mississippi, make a huge change that is bigger than us, that is bigger than the company we are going to build. And that was our mission from the beginning. That is our why. But that, I, where does the foresight for that come from? Because that, that is such a you know, looking up the face of the mountain and not even being able to see the top. You can say that, but before, you know, I even went into engineering school, the same thing for my husband, we knew independently and then together even more collaboratively that we wanted to do something really interesting, innovative, totally out of the box. Yeah, you need to go get the degrees. You need to work for an established company first to get the experience and the contacts. But we already knew we wanted to do something completely out there and this kind of fell in our laps with the homebrew project that we were doing and it became completely obvious that this was the path this was the way we changed mississippi so when you changed mississippi uh in the in the beginning uh it, it was quoted at the time that you guys had some of the worst laws as it related to beer and brewing and distribution and you know, the things that other states just might take for granted, even back then. Sure. I think to say they're worse is, is trying to put some intentionality to it. When okay. Really, what it was, no one ever thought about it. Um, wineries existed, and wineries had certain rights, and that's because somebody thought to write a law for wineries, and they put the word winery in there instead of saying, let's think beyond ourselves and put wineries and breweries. So it was more about not thinking about it yeah. than intentionally keeping this from happening. So what did, what did you push to change? Well, at first, we wanted to establish ourselves as a well-respected company, creating an industry that could be trusted. We wanted to be seen as good citizens that could then eventually impact some change. So we just laid low and showed that we understand the rules, we know how to follow them, and we're going to be good partners. you got to do that, I think. And then a consumer group called Raise Your Pints started getting very active. We mm -hmm. saw this as a great way to work with them. We had similar interests. They wanted some additional things. We wanted some other things that didn't have anything to do with them. And eventually we generated enough um, support around both of us that we could get some things changed. So it can't ever just be one person or one group. There has to be multiple interests coming together to make a change. 
So right off the bat, you were making beers that represented where you lived and the beers that you wanted to drink. And I, I, I want to get into that with the, I guess the other side of the coin is that there are so many people who open up today who are trying to appeal to you know, the, the 87% of drinkers that are in craft. So they're coming out with a Bondale or a lager or something that can get uh, non-craft drinkers you know, interested. Um, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of it, I, I guess, would have made sense early on to, to go after that marketplace but but it was like the devotees the people who were sort of searching in the you know the desert for craft beer or something different that that you spoke to early on and you did it in your own way we did um so the mississippi gulf coast is home to a lot of people who didn't start there we have Stennis Space Center, we have Keesler Air Force Base, the CB Base, a huge artist community. Um, this is a vacation community for New Orleans. So a lot of people with a lot of desires for other things were there and not able to get it. So that's where we realized that, oh wait, there are lots of people here who already know about craft beer. And as we we're introducing our homebrew beer to people who'd never had it before, we realized that there was a taste for it among other people as well. So how do you formulate recipes around that? Um, well, initially, you know, it, it kind of starts out as a shot in the dark. Uh, you know, the first set of beers that we made 15 years ago included the Southern Pecan that we had worked so hard on. And I thought, you know, that's going to be one of the small ones. The, the Amber beer at the time, Amber was everybody's flagship. Mm -hmm. I had an Amber. So I thought, let's do an Amber, a wheat, something light, because that'll be the introductory beer, right? And then this Pecan. You don't know what people are going to pick. The brewery doesn't get to pick its flagship. Your customers do. Yeah. And that's what we learned very quickly when Southern Pecan took the lead. So part of it is experimentation. Part of it is throwing stuff out there and seeing what's going to stick. Um, and sometimes you just realize you have an amazing liquid, but the name or the artwork around it is holding it back. So it's such a complex, ever-moving system you just don't know what's going to make it work. And if any of us did, um, we would all be billionaires, right? Sure. You guys would all be running Super Bowl yeah. commercials. <laughs> um, when you talk about the name and the I want to come back to the pecan beer in a minute. But when you talk about names, when you talk about artwork, yes, that is such an important part of getting your beer to consumers. And even these days, when you, when you look at, you know, some of the, the smaller brewers that are doing hazy IPA, it's, uh, you know, the, the sticker label on their can has to be visually appealing. I mean, we're, we're in this Instagram age right now where, um, people want to take pictures of the beers that they're proud to have purchased or, uh, you know, stolen off of somebody or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but when you first started, it was even, more important, right? Because there, there wasn't, am I, well, you're, you're, yeah. I mean, it's always important. Yeah. Um, so, but what did you learn in those early days that what worked and what didn't? Um, in the early days we only had draft, right? For two years, that's all we had. So it was all about the tap handle. Um, at the time there weren't a lot of tap handles in Mississippi, mm -hmm. so it was easier to stand out, but we wanted to make something really visually appealing, something that said Mississippi, something really classy, um, something that people go, Ooh, pretty. I want that. You somehow have to get that initial reaction. Um, we did get really fun and creative with names for a while. And we've recently come back to, let's make it really obvious to what this is. Um, and that hit home to me. I was standing in a restaurant watching somebody try to pick out a beer and I had my Southern hospitality IPA uh, up there. And this poor guy, he was looking around going, is there an IPA up there? And I realized he's not the problem. I'm the problem. I didn't put the information on there well enough for him to know what this beer is. So we redesigned everything to be very clear. So now when you look at a Southern Pecan label, Pecan is huge. For a while, a lot of people thought, is this Southern Peach? Because of the font. Okay. It didn't occur to me, but enough people say it. The customer is always right. If they are not seeing your label the way you think they're seeing it, they are right. Yeah. You need to fix that. So for me, now it's about clarity, telling people the, exactly what they're getting into. If, if you hand somebody a beer that has a fun name and it's a sour beer and they're expecting a blonde ale, you're going to lose that person pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. 
So communication is key. All right, I want to talk ingredients with you in just a moment, but uh, I need to take a quick break and say that great beers are made from select ingredients. With BSG, you'll bring the world to your brew house with an unparalleled and diverse selection of ingredients from across, across the globe to just down the road. Their dedicated customer service team and industry experience provides you with the assistance you need in every step of the way. Let BSG be your supplier of choice for products essential to making great artisanal beverages so you can stay focused on your craft. For more information, visit them at bsgcraftbrewing.com or contact them at one 800 374-2739. So how long did it take you? Because brewing with actual nuts is difficult. Can be. Yeah. yeah. You know, I and there's there's the difference between beers that really shine um, in a great way and ones that are, wow, this just tastes like a bucket of moldy nuts um yeah as it were and i've had i've had both and i've had yeah. stuff that's certainly in the middle um one being down south where pecans are so am i saying it the right way i say pecan pecan yes okay. but there i live on the gulf coast and um pecans pecans yeah pecans i that's not where i'm from Okay. I'm pecan. Pecan. All right. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to try to remember yeah. that as I talk to you so that I but don't embarrass myself. But you call it whatever myself. you want as that's, long as you drink look, it. Look I'm at that good. Southern hospitality that, that you're throwing out there. That's, that's very kind of you. <laughs> um, how do you approach brewing with them? Um, well, with nuts specifically, you have to understand you're dealing with a very unsaturated oil, right? So it wants to go rancid quickly. Mm -hmm. So treat the nuts properly is number one. Number two, um, beer is made from malt, okay? You have to have a good beer before you put the nuts in it. Before you incorporate the nuts, the beer has to be solid. The nuts are going to give it the final awesome touch. They're not going to take something mediocre or awful and make it good. They're only going to take something amazing and make it, what is that special thing that's happening there? So it's all about subtlety and all about in treating your ingredients right. So what part of the process, so, so your Southern Pecan um, is a, it's a brown ale? It is a nut brown ale. Okay. Yes. So where, did you experiment with, with adding it at different times or when it should go in or how it should go in or how you treat the, uh, the nuts before they go in? Um, well, the experimentation that I did was primarily around how much to add and how to treat them beforehand. Because um, it made sense to me that if there are carbohydrates in the nuts and there are some, some of those in there, you want those to hit the enzymes that the, that's in the mash. Mm -hmm. So I thought it made sense to put them in the mash um, because I didn't want those un unbroken down carbohydrates hanging around yeah. in fermentation. Okay. And that's worked out well for that's you. That's worked out very well, yes. You mentioned them going rancid as well. Yes. Uh, which, I mean, that's super, it, it's super important. It, it's not one of these things where, you know, you could have bags of aged hops sitting around for a while. I mean, it's, when they go bad, they go bad. And yeah, they go it's bad hardcore. Fast. And some people are really sensitive to rancidity. I am one of those people. I, if something's rancid, I'm, I'm out of the room. I'm yeah. going there. So how do you... For as much beer as you make, and this being your flagship, mm -hmm. um, how do you keep the supply chain as such where well, you don't have to worry you know, about pecans it? Pecans really are sensitive to oxygen, but as long as you keep them enclosed and refrigerated, they're good for okay. quite a while. So you're treating them a lot like you would? Hops, okay. yes. Very much like hops. Excellent. And then before you're putting them in the in the mash, are you doing anything with them? Are you toasting them? Are you? Um, we're just making sure that they're crushed properly because you want surface area. Okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of your beers, uh, you guys say on your website, and I've heard uh, you say this before, um, are southern focused, and you know pecans often make us think of the south. Um, but what else do you do that sort of gives Lazy Magnolia this southern flair? This uh, uh, you know, taste of the South, as it were. Uh, well, you know, we have a sweet potato beer. Okay. It's been a hit. It's been on our lineup 
since 2006. Is it a year-round beer? It started as a seasonal, but it was a light enough, easy enough to drink stout that we had to keep it year-round. It's year a sweet round. potato stout? It is. Okay. Yeah, so it's pretty light, about 4.5% alcohol. Okay. On the... On the drier side, really easy to drink, great with ice cream. Okay. So that's kind of our year-round dark beer. Um, there are so many people love dark beers, and we wanted to have that for them, and it's fun to make. Why yeah. settle on a stout with that? I, I mean, I, I think you know lighter beers could uh-huh. go a long way. You know, you might want to play with some of the color. Um, what that's was it an about interesting there? thought on the color, but it started out as a, my first ever winter seasonal and thinking, oh, okay, gosh, what am I going to do here? Everybody does pumpkin beers in the, in the winter. I don't really want to do pumpkin. That's not really a Southern thing. If we have pumpkins, they're grown somewhere else. But I always thought sweet potatoes had some similarity in flavor and texture to pumpkins. So I thought, why not just give that a try? Um, and I could get that locally, right? Mississippi is one of the biggest sweet potato growing areas in the country. Unfortunately, we don't have sweet potato processing, so a lot of that happens in Louisiana, but at least that processing is still happening locally as well. So I loved incorporating that local ingredient. We also work with honey that Mm -hmm. we get from um, a, a producer just north of us near Hattiesburg. So our southern gold is made with honey from the Hattiesburg area. So those bees, I might... I've run into one of those bees driving up there to get the honey, and that's just fun. I mean, it, it's fun, but it also helps further the story, right? It because, does, yes. Yeah. When you can tell somebody this beer that you're really digging right now, some of the ingredients for that came from like across the interstate from you, and that just kind of blows your mind, and you go, wow, something that's grown right here turned into this, and it's amazing, and it was made just down there, and you made that. I mean, putting the connections together and bringing everything local just kind of blows people's minds these days in a great way. And I love that. When you're working with native and local ingredients, though, each season can have variables to them. Some, you know, you can have great seasons and then you can have poor seasons. And so what do you do to combat some of that? Are you running trials? Like how do you, because especially for, for some of the seasonals or especially if you Mm -hmm. have a year round beer, if it tastes one way one week and then the next week it's, this is a little bit weird. I mean, Mm -hmm. that can start to erode confidence in the business. It can, and that's where on the nuts, um, two things. Like I said, you have a really, really excellent beer to start with, and the nuts just give it that tiny little something extra. Yeah. You can't have nuts be one of the legs of your three-legged stool. It's, you know, it's the paint on the top of the stool. Um, But pecan trees go through an interesting seven-year cycle, so you know that the supply has to move around over time. Um, and we've actually had pecans from Louisiana, South Carolina, Georgia. And I think at this point, the larger suppliers are able to source from farms in different areas or have farms in different cycles. So that hasn't been as much of an issue on the pecan side of things. But with some of the other ingredients? Um, sweet potatoes are pretty much sweet potatoes kind of all the time. Okay. Um, and once you get them cooked and canned, they're, they're kind of there um, for the apocalypse. Um, <laughs> Honey can be interesting. I mean, you have different <clears throat> varieties of honey. What we normally work with is a, a blend of gallberry, Tupelo honey. Um, we have a couple of other suppliers. We've worked with some wildflower honey as well. So we've got a couple of different suppliers. It, um, honey is is strange to work with, but it's fun too. The Southern Gold is a seasonal. So to have some variations and to go, that's what the flowers did this year that grow in your state. I think people accept that and understand it much more than they would for me to say, oh, I'm getting this generic orange blossom honey from China that's probably corn syrup. People would rather have variation and know that it's authentic. When you say strange, though, can you go a little bit deeper on that? Sure. Like, that's a strange ingredient? Honey can have a big mix of different types of sugars that ferment in wildly different ways, depending on the, the flour that you get it from. It can also come in with some fun wild yeast and bacteria. So depending on where you add that in the process, you could get some some really wild things happening. For our Southern Gold, which is meant to be a tailgating beer, we do boil that honey so at least it gets pasteurized. And the flower flavors, I mean, a dry year versus a wet year is going to concentrate or dilute the flavors of that honey and sometimes give it a different color. But this... I. Where consistency seems to be the name of the game, Mm -hmm. especially the larger you get. Is this the type of thing that keeps you up at night? 
Um, the consistency at that level is not what keeps me up at night. Yes, every batch is a little bit different, but there's an opportunity for some blending. You have specifications. You have a range that if it fits in here, it's good, yeah. right? And even for our Southern Pecan, we're brewing so much of that, we brew four batches into a single tank. That allows for a lot of variation to get blended away mm -hmm. because it's going to happen. You know, the morning brewer versus the night brewer, if I have to brew, God forbid, which I do sometimes. Um, so all that gets blended in and blended away. Um, but of all the things that keep me up at night, that ain't one of them. Okay. What keeps you up then? Um, what keeps me up is making sure my guys are safe, don't get hurt, and um, continue to get paid, honestly. Brew house safety is one of the things that I don't know if we discuss it enough. And we don't. I, I, I don't think it can be discussed enough, but we're, we're certainly not talking about it uh, in the way that we should. And every once in a while, uh, news trickles out of a brewery yep. of somebody who's been, you know, injured, uh, you know, by uh, faulty equipment or not using equipment pro uh, properly, or uh, scalded, or electrocuted, yes. or how do you? Well, I mean, if, if this keeps you up at night, that's what keeps me up at night. Because even it's interesting. I've I've done hazard analysis of a process and we've identified things that yeah this is a problem this could be a problem let's let's take matters you know take this seriously and do something to fix that and we have a list of things where we go this is this is never going to happen like this particular hazard doesn't exist it's that is that that happens yeah. and that blows my mind to go wow this is such a complex system that something that's never happened in 10 years and something that is designed out of the process somehow manages to come in um, you just have to be vigilant to everything and have a culture where people are not afraid to bring up problems and where safety is not a budget item. Safety just gets dealt with regardless of the budget. And people need to stop being embarrassed about something happening, about near misses. If you tell somebody about a near miss, you could save them from dying. Yeah. So yeah, brewery safety is huge. We need to talk about it more. Being on the board of the BA and traveling around, uh, as, as I'm sure you do, you know, now and again, I mean, there, there must be things that you see that just kind of, if this is top of mind for you, that kind of freak you out a little bit. And it, it can be a tough conversation to have brewery owner to brewery owner or brewer to brewer being like, hey, you know, have you, you know, thought about this? But it, if, if you're silent... That could mean somebody getting hurt. Well, you know, the technical committee of the BA has done a really good job of getting the word out about safety, making it really easy for breweries to, to do this. I mean, they've yeah. created videos. They've pretty much written programs. Um, so by the time we walk into a place and they know we're coming, they pretty much get it, and they're on the program. Sure. Yeah. But it, it, for the places where, you know, it's not announced or it's not an, an, an official tour. I mean, I'm just... I think for a lot of folks, when I talk to, to especially young brewers who don't come from an engineering background, mm -hmm. but who get into it because they have a passion, you know, for it, they see it as a lot of fun. They it see is a it, lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I think they might see it as, oh, well, I've worked in a commercial kitchen. This is no more dangerous than a commercial kitchen. Well, commercial kitchens are dangerous. Yeah. People get hurt in there. Um, so just take it a little bit more seriously and don't think that wearing your PPE makes you dorky. It makes you awesomely smart. Um, wearing your seatbelt on the forklift, things like that. These little things just go a long way to saving your life. And sure, if I see something blatant, I do want to point it out, but you have to be careful. You could turn somebody off and they just don't want you in there at all because you're you know, poking at them. Well, to hell with them though. I mean, it's, you know, somebody could get I hurt. I don't want them to get either. hurt either. <laughs> You know, it, it's interesting. I remember talking to a brewer from Goose Island um, uh, who was there before the sale and then after the sale. And I mm -hmm. saw this brewer about six months afterwards. And I said, you know, so what's different? You know, and that was the question that everybody mm -hmm. had at the time. And, uh, and he said to me, you know, my back doesn't hurt anymore. Oh. And I said, what, what does that mean? There's apparently at one of their, their small brew pubs, there's uh, four or five steps that you had to walk up gotcha. uh, to, to, you know, drop the grain into to mm -hmm. the mash tun. And um, uh, the compliance officers came in and they looked and they saw what, the way that they were mm -hmm. brewing. And they're like, hey, 
why don't you do this instead? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're like, don't tell us how to brew here at Goose, you know, you yeah, big corporate yeah. guys. And then, you know, and it's like, well, you can either do it or you can get fired. It's like, well, we'll do it. And, uh, and of course, the, you know, they had been doing it the wrong way. And yeah. he said his back no longer hurt. And it, I, it's even sort of simple, repetitive uh, stress and in, uh, injuries that uh, that people should be thinking. About. Yeah, I mean uh, that that is a big deal. And for me, it's more about what do you need to be locking out or tagging out before you go poking around in a piece of equipment. And I had this conversation with one of my guys the other day. I said, "Look, I've got you lock out tag out equipment up there. Before you open up this panel, you got to put the lock on, put the key in your pocket." And he's trying to argue with me, and I'm going, "This is 15 seconds of your life that could yeah. save your arm." Argument over. Um, you just got to lay down the law. You know, there is no budget. There is no time system for safety. You just do it. You talked about equipment uh, early on uh, with, you know, if you wanted something made, you'd have Mark do it uh, for you. What are some of the fun toys and tools that you guys have installed in your brew house that make you uniquely you? Make us uniquely us. I mean, that's really the, the people that make us uniquely us, right? Um, Anybody can take a brew house and, and try to brew beer on it, but it, each brewer is going to do something different. It's like giving the, a recipe for biscuits to yeah. 15 Southern ladies. You're going to get 15 different biscuits from the same recipe. That's a right? party I want to go to, um, but yeah. <laughs> that would be a great party. Um, but the piece of equipment that is personally my favorite at the moment, my new boyfriend for the last few years, is the pasteurizer, uh -huh. the tunnel pasteurizer. It's one of those sleep at night kind of things because... After the boys not getting hurt, boys and girls not getting hurt, it's making sure my product is still good after being abused in the marketplace. Okay. How important is that? It is everything. Okay. Go deeper on that. I mean, this because <laughs> this is something like we're living in an age of exploding cans. We're living in an age where... You know, shelf stable is uh, a suggestion. Um, yeah, that's just not gonna cut it. Um, you know, nobody likes to get the calls about my beer was sour, it was foaming over, it was gushing. It's awful to get those calls and then to track down what happened, why did this happen. Now, yeah, you still have to be very clean and make sure that the beer getting to the packaging line is good, but it's just that extra little step that you can take to go. It's going to be fine. It's going to get stuck on the way to the distributor, sitting on the side of the road for two days. It's going to go into the hot shelf, sitting in the sun somewhere, but it's going to be okay. And you know what? I can also send it to Panama because it'll survive the boat trip. <laughs> it just opens up a lot, a lot of new worlds, but it does force you to make sure everything else heading up to that point is perfect because pasteurization doesn't work if you have a lot of dissolved oxygen. Are you sending your beer to Panama? We are. Okay. I, I don't really have a follow-up to that. I just wanted to. Um, in China. Okay. Really? Yes. Why? Um, because we That'll have the opportunity. Follow up on. Um, we, we met up with a great um, exporter in the U.S., St. Amand. They specialize in wines, and they wanted to add some beers to their portfolio. So they have a, a small group of breweries that they're working with. They specialize in Central South America and the Caribbean, and they've expanded their operations into um, Asia. Well, sure, because geography-wise, so. that makes total sense. I mean, if you're already in that world, thankfully, I'm just dealing with my U.S.-based broker, who's been awesome. Um, yeah, but does, don't, don't like some of the states want your beer before? Maybe they do, but they're not calling me and letting me know. These okay. days, my folk, my, the way I approach distribution is if I'm, if I'm approached, yeah, let's have the conversation, see if this makes sense. But it's not the right time for my brewery to go out looking for a distributor. If, if I'm going to have my beer in a state. I want to know that somebody cared enough to pull it in. I'm not pushing it there, but that's just where we are right now. And that strategy may change, um, at any point, but that's where we are right now. Your brewery is 14 years old. This is, yeah, we're 14 years old, starting our 15th year. It's curious though, that you have international distribution. Um, but that, you know, it, you're not going to go out looking for us based distribution, but, um, are the calls fewer and far between these days with 7,100 breweries? Is, is the appeal of you know, Mississippi's first Prohibition brewery uh, not what it was? You know, you're right. I mean, there are so many breweries to choose from, so much local choice available, and many distributors are doing skew rationalization. They're saying, we're going to work with 
X number of top breweries and just take their flagship plus one. And if something doesn't have a hurdle, doesn't hit this hurdle rate, we're dropping it. This is the reality right now. I don't know how long that's going to be the case, but that's where we are. So yeah, we find opportunities and we run with it. Because it's not just nationally, right? I mean, when, when you were saying that the South early on uh, wasn't uh, lighting the fires in the way that you wanted it to, and yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't ignited, um, you came along uh, around that same time, uh, Yazoo and Nashville yep, started were... coming up, Abita started making big runs. Yep. I mean, there were breweries that were, you know, of your uh, uh you know, craft graduating class, as it yep. were. Well, Abita's you know, yeah, twenty around, years beyond but, us. But yeah. they started making yeah. So know, Terrapin and Yazoo, they were right, right at the same class. Yeah, they right. were they were making things happen right around the same time. So it's exciting to have them. And Sweetwater was very young at that point. But but you were able to get the toehold in and say, okay, well, we're Mississippi's brewery, and there's Georgia's brewery, and there's Tennessee's yep. brewery, and et cetera. You know, Louisiana, et cetera. Um, but these days, it's 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 got to be harder, and we're even seeing this with a lot of the legacy brands that have been around for forty years now. With Sierra being mm-hmm. flat, Sam Adams being down, New Belgium being down, um, you know, breweries that have you know grown and been big, but were so influential, you know, at their time. I mean, they're still turning out a yeah, ton of still beer. very influential. Yeah, they're, they're still turning yeah. out a ton of beer, but with so much choice out there, it's harder to. The older you are as a brewery, it's harder to keep top of mind for folks. And in an area like the South where, you know, the, the, the larger players are still ruling the roost. And, you know, craft is, you know, if craft is 13% nationally, I, I don't know what the number 0. is. 0.3. So there it is. So how do you stay relevant, I guess? is We the, make sure the beer is really good, i.e. pasteurizer. Yeah. We make sure the beer is solid. Um, and that we have a good reputation in the market so that if people can trust my Southern Pecan, if they see something else made by us, they trust that we're going to make something good. And yeah, it's hard. Business is just hard, no matter who you are. Yeah. It's just really hard right now. But the younger generation that's coming up right now mm-hmm. who are not pasteurizing, who are not, you know, they're just kind of go, they're having a good time. Like they're, and you know, there's absolutely a place for all of that. There are some breweries who are thriving, selling their beer in one city block. Yeah. I'm so jealous. Are you? I am. How great would that be? I, I mean, I talked to what, so Wachusett <laughs> Brewing Company years ago. And in at the time, they were, yeah. yeah, they were brewing gobs more beer than we were and selling in like one county. Uh-huh. One county. It's it amazing. Blows, right? I'm in yeah. like 18 states and three foreign countries and have 20% of my volume as contract. And I'm, I'm doing my best to hang on here, you know? Wachusett's is one of those brands. We actually wrote about them. I wrote about them in the uh, Brewing Industry Guide for the magazine. And uh, yeah, the majority of their beer is done in like central Massachusetts. And what an awesome population to have. Oh, yeah. You know, in Mississippi, we're, we're working on getting there. But, you know, things are slower. Take time. It's not just beer alone, though. Right, I, we're starting to see breweries branch out and partner with different corporations or different beverages, and getting themselves into uh, different markets as well to reach new clientele, to to sort of uh, you know keep the lights on, as it were. But also, well, yeah, to, all businesses do that. Sure, I mean, no, I, exactly. Look at yeah. the distribution business. You've got legacy beer distributors now, kind of merging with some wine and spirits distributors. Everybody's doing what they can to maximize efficiency and and do what's best for them and their stakeholders. And you've recently started doing that. I mean, we've been doing contract brewing since we had a bottling line. Right. So that's been going on forever. And I'm, I'm really proud of our graduates, as I call them, the okay. people who are now completely on their own and doing great. You know, shout out to Bayou Tesh. Love those guys. Oh, yeah. Carlos um, Knott. He's, yeah, uh, he's yeah. one of the great guys. And we've recently been doing a few bottled water projects. I mean, we have the facility, right? Mm-hmm. It's great bottling equipment. It's new. It's a, it's great stuff. I mean, why wouldn't you put water through the same thing? And um, so rainwater can be next. So uh, so I asked you before yeah, we yeah. started. I said, "What are you excited about?" And I'm you really said, excited rainwater. about this rainwater. We we're working with. I was I was trying to give you like an <laughs> elegant way into this, and now I'm just going to be. I'm like, trying right, to just, be you know, no, just be t- respectful of beer. No, that's fine. Um, no, it's fine. Tell me yeah. about rainwater. So there it is. There's Richard's the, there's rainwater the out of yeah. Austin, Texas. They're established. What's They've, the name of the company? Richard's is? Richard's rainwater. Okay. Yep. So they're an established company out of Austin, Texas. They've been making a great product that's been very popular. 
more popular than they can fill right now because Austin doesn't get quite as much rain as South Mississippi. Um, so we had this perfect combination of lots and lots of rain and plenty of roof space to collect the right amount of water and a great bottling facility to, to get that water done. So, so we you have will, buckets on the roof? Is that what this Not is? buckets. Um, so the collection system is tied into the downspouts okay. coming off the roof. So the rain hits the roof, it comes to the existing downspouts, and then the collection system starts there. It routes the water to a big tank, and from there it's held okay. as long as we need to. It's purified, carbonated, and then sent to the packaging line. Okay, so it's not a, it's not a still, but it's sparkling. They do make a, spill, a still product. But we are going to be starting on the sparkling. Okay. So I think their still product is in plastic bottles. We're not quite ready for that. Where's the intersection or can there be an intersection with beer? Because Absolutely. I, no, okay. that, that'll be a lot of fun to make a rainwater beer. So water chemistry, I'm kind of a, a little chemistry geek. So water chemistry is always a big deal to me. This will be really, really interesting water because essentially it's distilled water, mm -hmm. right? You can do anything with it. And what, what kind of interesting things will it do to a stout, to a hazy IPA, to have that completely pure water? I, your gonna, eyes just lit up as we fun. started talking yeah. about this. I mean, it, yeah. everything else was just sort of like, all right, that's a boring question, y'all. <laughs> but like, you know, this... I, you're jazzed about Yeah, this. the rainwater's been fun, and it's, it's making us do a lot of extra stuff. So we'll be the first permitted facility for drinking water in the state. Permitted surface water drinking water facility based on rainwater. So this is a first for Mississippi. I love making history, and it's been great working with the health department on all of this. Um, you never hear somebody no, say that. Nobody but, has ever um, said that. That is, you know, yeah. <laughs> no, it's been great because really Mississippi, you know, we get a bad rap, but... All of our state agencies are generally, they take the, the whole attitude of, oh, I've never heard of that before. Let's figure it out. We'll do it. Really? Yeah, yeah. They've been great. Yeah. Wow. All right. That's, it's sort of changing my perception of, of, of what the, you know, some of these agencies could be. So no, Mississippi's agencies have never been a roadblock to our success. Okay. Um, you know, they, they are bound by the laws that are on the books, Right. There's nothing they can do about that, but they do a really good job of managing and taking care of the businesses that they're supposed to manage. You know, we have a lot of folks who are thinking about opening breweries who listen to this or, you know, who are still sort of young uh, in, in, in the game and folks who are established as well. If government agencies weren't the roadblock. They're not. What what was for you early on? Um, or even now? Well, I mean, even now it's a matter of... You know, Mississippi just not having enough craft beer drinkers. I think the independence movement that the BA has started is going to help us with that because it's so difficult to get the word out to people that, hey, if you drink my beer that's made here, I'm paying people who work and live here. I'm buying stuff from here. That creates money for roads and bridges and schools and parks. You yeah. like roads and bridges and schools and parks, right? <laughs> or you could buy this big beer that's coming from who knows where, and the money's going to a foreign country, and you're literally pissing your money down the drain. Yeah. You're, you're sending your dollars out of state, and the liquid is going in the toilet. Yeah. And to finally have an ally to put some better marketing to that than I could have. The independence movement is really going to help that. 0.3% of beer sold in Mississippi is made in Mississippi. 0.3. Wow. wow. Yeah. Okay. So that is what we're up against. It, we're up against a consumer who doesn't care, who doesn't get it. Is there something other than, or in addition to the seal that's out there that you can be doing to get people to care? That's, that's a really difficult thing. I mean, you're talking about a consumer education campaign that could take a generation. Right. Right? Of course. So it's more about waiting this out, just continuing to hammer it home and waiting it out. It's a generational thing. And if we hadn't started 15 years ago, we wouldn't be where we are now. I think it's going to start snowballing. Um, but snowball's still really, really tiny. Um, yeah, not a lot of snow that yeah. you guys get down there. So we're just trying to change the attitude within Mississippi. There's still kind of an inferiority complex. If you go to Texas, those people there are mad about Texas. If it ain't made in Texas, <laughs> you can know. just leave. Yeah. Um, but in Mississippi, it's more like if it's made in Mississippi, it can't possibly be good. 
we're changing that. We're starting to see that roll over and people take pride in what's coming out of our state because there's a lot of really good stuff, but it's a slow change and it's really painful. And beer is one of those things that can, that can help with that. I mean, beer it's, is a, one it's that's so helping, personal. Yes. Yeah. Um, in a minute, I'm going to ask you what your hope is for beer. But before that, I just want to thank our sponsors. Gene D. Chiller is the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling. You should join your peers April 8th through 11th in Denver for the Craft Brewers Conference and the Brew Expo America. And also bring the world to your brew house with select ingredients from BSG. Leslie Henderson, Lazy Magnolia Brewing, what is your hope for beer? My hope for beer is and has always been that we can reach more people and let them know what great things we have in the beer world for them. So this is a diversity thing. We've got something for everybody. And if you come to our tap room, the porch at Lazy Magnolia, you will see the most eclectic group of people of all ages, backgrounds, um, beer tastes, some who don't even drink beer. That is my image of what a brewery is. We have people who don't even drink beer coming in and having a fantastic time. So it's about community. It's about diversity. It's about bringing people together and improving the community. Is it diversity in the beers as well too? That too. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm, Although I love beer and I love all kinds of strange beers, I'm not a beer snob. Um, there's a beer for everything. If you only want to drink Blondales, we can still be friends. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, taking some time. You're here in New York, and uh, I know you only have a limited amount of time, so hanging out with me in a conference room, I can't imagine, uh, was high on your list. So thank you so much for, it for was taking pretty high the time. Well, actually. I appreciate yeah. it. it uh, if you, dear listeners, have questions for me, guests you'd like to hear on the show, uh, comments, questions, etc. You can reach out to me at John Hall, J O H N H O L L at beerandbrewing.com or follow along the conversation on Twitter at John underscore Hall. You should also go to beerandbrewing.com. There you can subscribe to our magazine, both uh, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine and our Brewing Industry Guide, which I mentioned earlier on when I was talking about Massachusetts. Uh, and you can also read about uh, home brewing and this craft beer world that we're in right now. Uh, learn about great brewers and their processes and the ingredients that they're using by going to beerandbrewing.com. Leslie, thank you so much again for, for, for doing this. This was, uh, this was a real treat and uh, hope to get down to visit you guys again soon. You're welcome anytime. All right. Thanks so much. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.